All right, uh, we're looking at Shakespeare's great play, Measure for Measure, and that is up on the screen, but for some reason it goes beyond the breadth of the screen. I find that puzzling. It's not interesting. Or not interesting, but it uh, is... I don't know why that is the case. Anyway, um, it's a, a take on uh, Matthew's Gospel uh, 7 verse 2, with what me- judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. With what measure ye meet, ye shall be, it shall be measured to you again, measure for measure. So judge not lest ye be judged. It's a play, therefore, about uh, judgment. It's also a play about the law. It's also a, le- a play, as we shall see, about politics. And it is a play, uh, ultimately, about Christian virtue and mercy. This is, uh, was performed first in December 26, 1604. Uh, The very same time he started writing his tragedies, and so it's fitting that it be so, because this is probably the darkest of Shakespeare's comedies. It is a comedy, but it is a dark comedy. Some call it a problem play, problem uh, for the sake of categorization, I would say. Otherwise, not a problem play, but only in in that sense it's a problem play. The fact that he wrote it in uh, the year he wrote the tragedies, in fact, in the very year he wrote Othello, uh, suggests that the dark sides of life uh, were foremost in his mind. Now, I said to you that both his comedies and his tragedies resolve themselves in some sort of a unity. There is a resolution. The problems are not uh, hanging at the end. They are resolved, but they're resolved differently in comedies than they are in tragedies. The comedy, as we saw in Midsummer Night's Dream, resolves itself in a marriage, and we'll see that that is the case here as well. There is a marriage. But it is uh, potentially disastrous, and there is little comic relief in this play, relatively speaking. There is some, but uh, not that much. And uh, one could uh, speculate that the reason why this is the last of his comedies is because he's experienced a little bit of life and uh, things are a little bit darker than they used to be in his view. I don't know whether it's more mature to regard tragedy as more in keeping with the way of life or comedy. Uh, Aristotle thought it was tragedy. Shakespeare's later plays are tragedies. Is that the reflection of experience or is it something else? I wonder. I don't know the answer. Uh, There is a source for this story, by the way, and it does deal with the destructive forces of Eros in the same way that Midsummer Night's Dream did. So lust is uh, one of the themes of the play. And the effects of lust and the destructive consequences of lust, which is a result of being in the throw of the passions and uh, the imagination of that there's something good and ennobling in the passions rather than simply destructive. We saw that that was uh, at work in a Midsummer Night's Dream, but it wasn't. It didn't actually play out in the end. It was thwarted by the dramaturge figure of Oberon, the king of the fairies. Here we're coming to a different uh, type of play because there are no supernatural figures in this play. There are no fairies who are going to intervene. They are only political figures. Those are the foremost. Uh, they are. They are the ones who are in charge of arranging things uh, to their proper outcome. The source of the play, I think I just mentioned that. There are Italian uh, stories by a man named Cinthio, C-I-N-T-H-I-O. A hundred stories called Hectomithi. I'm not sure there's two T's. In fact, there isn't two T's. There's only one T. I'll get rid of that for my own sake. Hundred stories. And this is one of them. 
Uh, in that story, there's a duke in Vienna who rules, and he uh, obtains a surrogate ruler, somebody who will rule in his stead, by the name of Angelo, a man reputed and famed for his virtue, a young man. And then there's a couple by the name of Claudio and Juliet who consummate their love before marriage. And Claudio is sentenced to death by Angelo for this breach of the law. Angelo is then seduced by Isabella, refuses to satisfy his desires. And then at this point, Shakespeare departs from his sources because in uh, Cinthio, Isabella assents, says okay, and agrees to sleep with Angelo to get her brother off the hook. Shakespeare, she remains faithful, may, remains virtuous, does not sleep with the ruler in order to get her brother off the hook. So there's a departure, and this is characteristic of Shakespeare. He uses his sources but feels free as it suits him to deviate from it somewhat. This always, um, in our day, there tends to be in historical fiction, because this is a, a sort of historical fiction, although I'm not sure that even in, in uh, uh, Cynthia's um, rendering, these were stories of uh, actual historical events, or if they were just um, stories that he made up that Shakespeare is borrowing from. Uh, whether it matters whether it actually happened down to the letter in the retelling of it, Shakespeare seems very happy to deviate from the uh, original source if it suits him for his purposes as an artist, and we'll come to why he does that later on. That, I think, is something we need to consider here. Um, but the question that Shakespeare, Shakespeare is going to ask is, is, is chastity worth the price of death? Is Christian fidelity worth dying for? Um, I said that this was a play, it was a comedy, and I said that it was a political play. It's also, when I say it's a political play, he's engaging literally with political ideas. And uh, the one idea that I want us, or the one writer that I want us to think about here, who would have been foremost in Shakespeare's mind whenever he's like, discussing politics, is that it, what's going on in his contemporary uh, the contemporary writer Niccolo Machiavelli, whom you've heard of, Machiavelli, who wrote a work called The Prince. Now, this is uh, writ written during the Italian Renaissance, um, 15th century, 16th century Florence. There were, there were a whole slew of books that were written, um, called, uh, often called Mirrors for Princes, so little guidebooks for princes to read uh, let's hold the mirror up to you. You're going to rule, and you rule with certain, a certain authority. How will you be a good ruler? So Machiavelli wrote one called The Prince. There was another one called uh, by Patrizzi, The Kingdom and the Education of the King. One by Saki called The Prince. Carafa called The Office of a Good Prince. Pontano, The Prince, etc. So very common for these books to be read. We don't tend to hear about the other ones. Machiavelli is the one we do hear about and the one that Shakespeare would know of. Now Machiavelli um, is the one who's famous because he's infamous. Uh, infamous because he's associated with giving advice that uh, uh, Shakespeare would tend to see as scandalous. He says it's more important to be seen as virtuous than actually to be virtuous. The appearance of virtue is helpful. However, the actual being a virtuous, being a Christian in office, Machiavelli would have regarded as counterproductive, not very realistic to be so. And therefore, the uh, Christianity is used as a facade in order to hold on to power, to exercise power. And the purpose of holding power seems to be foremost. Now, Shakespeare would have regarded this, uh, the, the attainment of power and the control of power, 
for the sake of holding on to power as deplorable. Shakespeare and his age. And it would have been characteristic of the problem with, Florin, uh, with Florence. And if you want to watch a little bit of that, watch the you know, television uh, miniseries now on uh, the De' Medici's or something like that. So uh, sordid politics for the sake of power and with a religious sort of uh, veneer, but beneath that, uh, it's about the money and it's about power. Uh, whether that's fair to Machiavelli or not, that's beside the point more or less. It's more that uh, that is associated with Machiavelli and his, his counsel. <coughs> and occasionally, even in the case of Machiavelli, he would regard uh, it's occasionally you have to uh, execute one of your followers just to make sure people remain fearful of you from time to time because it's, it's useful. So this is regarded as Machiavellian politics and I, I find that this is interesting and helpful uh, in our day um, because uh, a lot of what Shakespeare's discussing in Measure for Measure, the sexual scandal, the appearance of virtue, um, the reality of sordid politics underneath the surface seems uh, pretty relevant at the time when there's a political scandal that's just broken out, our prime minister wearing blackface. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, uh, having a racial appearance uh, when he has been rather harsh on those who have skeletons in their closet in the past. He's let go of his own MPs for such things and saying there's zero tolerance for it. Um, that seems to be rather apropos. Uh, so the the Duke Angelo, who's renowned for his uh, good deeds, etc., um, might come into our site. But uh, I want to talk about uh, that. So first of all, that idea of uh, a Machiavellian politician, because the, the hero of this story, there are many heroes, by the way, but the main figure, the dramaturge figure, and he is again a, dra a dramaturge figure, Remember, we had one last time in Oberon, king of the fairies. <coughs> this time is the Duke Vincentio. And it's, I think, telling, probably appropriate, that Shakespeare is throwing his play in Italy. He's not commenting on the way the Italians are, although because it will apply equally to England, because sin and vice <laughs> and, uh, and political corruption and the pretense of virtue is uh, ubiquitous. It's not an Italian thing per se. Uh, and when I say Italy, it, he's the Duke in Vienna. So that's not even Italy per se, it's an Italian name. Um, but from Italian source, but he sticks them in Vienna. Now, um, this uh, statement, with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and by what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. It is directly addressing Jesus' uh, statement in the Sermon on the Mount. This is the way it ought to be. And so this is a play, a bit, to some degree, about political, the political possibility of attaining God's righteousness on earth. How possible is it through politics, practically speaking? Um, so this figure, Vincentio, is the uh, orchestrator of the plot. As I said, the dramaturge figure. Uh, in, in this, he is like uh, Oberon, but he's also like Iago in Othello, who is an anti-dramaturge figure, strictly speaking. Uh, he's like Don Pedro, he's like Oberon, uh, he's like Prospero in The Tempest, he's like any number of figures actually. That, so it's a very common uh, thing for Shakespeare to do to put a dramaturge figure within the play. And then the play thereby, to some degree, is a commentary about theatre and the way that art and politics, because politics is a sort of art. Don't, when we think of art, we tend to think of painting or theater or fiction, and that, those are, that's art, this reduction of things. 
but art in Shakespeare's understanding is simply a technical way or an intellectual way of dealing with the, the natural world. So the art of politics, we can say it that. And so the dramaturge figure is using the art of the politician. And the question then, and it's a question we're going to ask and try and address over the course of four lectures, is, is Vincentio a Machiavellian ruler? Or is he something else? Is he a Christian ruler, for example? Because it's quite clear to me from the outset that he, when he employs Angelo to act as his surrogate, that he is aware that Angelo will fail as a ruler. He's not up for it. He is a very virtuous young man or reputed for it, and yet he lacks the judgment uh, and ability to actually be a good ruler. So he sets him up. That's very Machiavellian. You bring somebody in to do the dirty work, and then you take care of him. Uh, Donald Trump did this under one of his... Uh, Gosh, who, what was the name of the guys? Was it oh, Scaramucci, Scaramucci? What was his name? Anyway, brought some guy in. It was a three, four years. It was three years ago. Two, three years ago. He brought him in. This guy came in. And he fired several people. And then when everyone was outraged at it, then Trump fired him. So he said, okay, he's taking care of it. So he did all the dirty work. Everyone was angry at that guy. And then he got. <coughs> so is that not what's happening here? Is, is Angelo not being brought in to do some dirty work and then we get to take care of Angelo? That's a very Machiavellian thing to do. Companies do this, by the way. They bring in somebody to clean up the mess and then, of course, when everyone's outraged, then you take care of the person who's cleaned up the mess and then the prob problem is, taken, is solved and everybody's happy because the bad guy's been done away with and they're happy with the person that appointed the bad guy to begin with. Very Machiavellian, very effective. Uh, so my interest in this play is not only because as a Shakespeare, uh, as an uh, English scholar, as somebody who likes the play, I think this has applications to contemporary politics, management, church, governance, family relations, all of those things. Anywhere where it ta you have to apply things practically and deal with the reality of human life where there is sin and corruption, and uh, the appearance of virtue and how do you deal with things without making matters worse and with this in mind with what judgment ye judge ye shall be judged and the measure that you apply will be applied to you so if you are f severe in your judgment don't expect mercy that's the same there's no double standard so we're going to avoid the hypocrisy with which the pharisees we're charged. We need to avoid that. Now, here's the problem for the Duke. The Duke has let his kingdom go to seed. Do you know what I mean by that? He hasn't been taking care of his charge. His charge is to look after the kingdom. He's allowed uh, body houses, dens of prostitution to pop up all over the place and he's just let it happen. And he's a, a man renowned and loved by all the people. Why is he loved by all the people? Because he is a soft-hearted, generous, friendly man. He doesn't chastise anyone, so they love him. But the consequence of this conduct is that sin is now growing. And the very city of Vienna that he's there to look after is suffering at, under his rulership and he is now aware of it and it's got to the point where he he recognizes he needs to do something now why has he done this because i think the duke is portrayed even from the beginning as a good man he's a good man so why has he allowed this to happen then and the answer is <coughs> that he is too much of an intellectual now this is again a common theme in shakespeare He's too caught up in the theory. He, he loves his books. He enjoys uh, 
intellectual ideas, the debates, he enjoys the academy, everything associated with it. And it's hard work to govern and be involved in the practicalities of everyday living. People are messy and he doesn't like dealing with that and he's let it go because it's not his primary interest. So he's acted to some degree like Plato's philosopher kings, the ideal rulers who behold the good and the just and understand those things. But he's not uh, very useful in the actual government, governance of his city. So that's his problem. And, and in this, he is like many other rulers, and the best one I can think of is Prospero in uh, The Tempest, who was also, de he was deposed by his brother because he was, again, he loved his books too much. And his brother saw the opportunity and deposed him, put him on a boat, and he ended up in the middle of an island somewhere. But it was because he loved his books too much and did not look to the practicalities of act uh, power politics, if you will, whereas where his brother was Machiavellian and understood those things very well and got him out. So that is another problem. What is the right measure of um, intellectual, the love of the good in and for of itself, as well as balancing that out with how do I apply this in practice? And this is something you'll c that will confront you when you leave a university, which is a very rarefied atmosphere where, you, where we can talk of ideas without any practical consequences. Your professors can say the stupidest things and not face any consequences for saying them. This is one of the, the uh, joys of academic freedom, I guess, is that, no, it is to some degree, is that there is a, there are, you can, talk about things with no consequences as silly as they can be because, to, because that allows you to then tease them out to their inevitable end and at that point then to abandon them rather than to immediately, like if you have to make decisions that are going to have a practical effect every time you do them, then you can't think about things and take the time to consider and contemplate. So there are virtues to being able to do that, and we enjoy those. I enjoy that myself. But he can't do that, and so he, he's not minded to be the, the sort of Renaissance uh, king that Shakespeare would have him to be, because the Renaissance man is capable of both uh, thought and action. He has to do both. He has to marry both, and the kings of his day would uh, represent this, the Renaissance ideal. So they are men who have studied long, but are also men of action. Henry VIII was, uh, at least he, in his own eyes, was one such man. Elizabeth, his daughter, was likewise, by the way. She had, she had studied, she wrote in Latin, she was a, a formidable intellect, but she was also a ruler who knew how to rule and get things done. Uh, very common in the day. Uh, this duke is the opposite in the sense that he is not a man of action and that's a problem. You cannot have a person in office who cannot act and doesn't know when to act and that is a hard thing, very difficult thing. But the duke when we meet him has recognized the error in his ways so that we're entering measure for measure uh, at the a time of crisis and the Duke is going to try and fix things. So he, he is going to bring in Angelo in his stead for three reasons, I'll suggest to you. One, he wants to restore order to the kingdom. It's in chaos. It's gone to seed because he's let it. Nature left untended is like an unweeded garden. Human nature and all nature if you don't tend your garden, your garden turns into a field of weeds. That's they, where do the weeds come from? Who knows? They seem to grow faster than the other plants and they choke out all the, the good plants. That is the same thing. That, anal that exact analogy is one that Shakespeare regularly uses in his plays, in his history plays. 
so he has let it happen. The gardener, and remember that the idea of the gardener is one that comes straight out of scripture. God is portrayed as a gardener. Adam and Eve are also gardeners. They bear the image of God. They're called to uh, cultivate, exercise dominion over the Garden of Eden. Right? And God is often portrayed in this sense as a gardener. Well, he has, he has allowed his kingdom to go to seed, and he needs to restore order. So that's the first motivation. The second is he wants to test and to teach all of his subjects. And they include the one that he's put in place to govern in his stead, Angelo, in other words. He wants to test Angelo, and he wants to teach Angelo. Thirdly, and this is the most interesting in some ways, he wants to observe and learn from this little experiment. Learn from the actions of others. Because this is part of being a dramaturge figure, is to some degree you're watching the play that you yourself are orchestrating and learning from it. The problem, though, is that the Duke is not strict enough his rule. So let me go to Act 1, Scene 3, and I'll read these lines. Act 1, Scene 3, line uh, 19. This is the Duke speaking to Friar Thomas, and I'll, I'll just read this, and I think it will set the stage for us quite well. The Duke says, We have strict statutes and most biting laws, the needful bits and curbs to headstrong weeds, which for this 14 years we have let slip, even like an o'ergrown lion in a cave that goes not out for prey to prey. Now, as fond fathers, having bound up the threatening twigs of birch, only to stick it in their children's sight for terror not to use, in time the rod becomes more mocked than feared. So our decrees, dead to infliction, to themselves are dead, and liberty plucks justice by the nose. The baby beats the nurse, and quite athwart goes all decorum. There's the problem. Those that are to be under governance are ungoverned, and they act in, uh, they act in accordance with their sinful nature. Even, and, the, and the illustration that's most potent here is that the baby beats the nurse. How many children have you seen hitting their parents in public without any consequences or any even sense that this is not right? I was just going to ask, do you see a, a dualism or a comparison to what's happening in society today with tolerance? I, I, to this? Do you not? No, I do. I'm just asking. <laughs> I think, so this, this play, uh, when it was taught to me I first encountered it as an undergraduate, it struck me how relevant it was to contemporary events. 30 years on, it's pretty much the same, although even more so. I do think that the uh, lack of restraint and the unwillingness to apply rules and order uh, has allowed our country to go to seed. Yes. And you can see that all over the place, in politics, in churches, in families, in everywhere, in schools, in the classroom. M most of what teachers do these days is just classroom management. They can't actually teach. It's one of the things I like here is I, I actually get to teach. I don't have to do classroom management. So I think it's, this is a university. If you don't want to be here, you don't have to be here. I'm not going to beat you up over it. This is great. You know, sure, there's the door, right? And, and so people having, knowing that, are happy to be here. There's, but if you did that for grade twos, they'd all leave, mm -hmm. of course, of course. Because they'd much rather be playing or doing something else. Well, by this point, you're here because you want to be here, presumably, presumably. Um, so that's the problem. And it's not that they lack laws. It's not that they lack the, uh, structures there to create order, but they have not implemented them. It's like, and, and he uses the analogy of a birch, a birch to the rod hit the child with. So I threaten you with the birch, but I never actually use it. So when, now when I threaten you with it, people just say, you're not going to use that. So there's no fear. 
and he, so he talks about fear. So let me talk very briefly because I think uh, it's germane to the topic, but also something that we may not know that in Christian understanding, Christ, and Shakespeare, by the way, assumes a Christian audience. He does assume a Christian audience. That there are three uses of the law that Shakespeare and his contemporaries would understand. And I will uh, eschew the Latin phrases here, and I'll just use the, the English. There is the civil use. There is the pedagogical. And then finally, we'll call it the normative. And let me explain all three. The civil use. And now let me say one further thing, because I do need to say this. Shakespeare's assumptions is that the laws of a kingdom will mirror the law of God in the Bible. I don't need that anymore. That they will mirror it. That God's laws will be reflected in human laws. So the Ten Commandments are the basis of English common law. They have been the basis of Western law ever since the time of Justinian, by the way, the Justinian Code, brought in by the Empress Theodora. Theodora was a prostitute, became queen, and influenced, so influenced Justinian that he, brought, he, he, he gave uh, rights to women to inherit property and so forth. They didn't have before that. It was very interesting. This is because of biblical law. It's not Roman law. Under Roman law, women have no rights. Justinian, the empress, who had been a prostitute but was a Christian convert, so influenced her husband that she brought in the lo a law throughout the Western world, the Roman Empire, and that would include Britain, that brought the Ten Commandments into the laws of the nations. So Shakespeare just simply assumes that any law that's worthy of being called a law is going to be a reflection of biblical truth. I need to say that because since in the last few centuries there's been a dispute about that fact and we've departed from that understanding. But Shakespeare would never ever even question this. It was beyond question. So with that said, there is a civil use to the law and this will make sense then. What is the, what is the civil use? The law serves the commonwealth or, or the body politic as a force to restrain sin. This is the civil use. It restrains sin. It prevents sin from growing. And this is what he's just illustrated. The law was there to restrain sin, but they didn't apply it, and therefore sin abounds. And the body politic has been poisoned by this or infested with weeds. And now further consequences. So not only is there prostitution, there's venereal disease. Not only is there venereal disease, there are children outside wedlock. The children outside wedlock uh, have no legal, they don't have the same legal rights as children who are born within marriage. So now they have problems and they're born with this problem. Is it their fault? No. So now the, the problems just keep unfolding. That's the problem. So this is the civil use of the law. It restrains sin. Now these come out of general revelation even. This isn't even biblical law. The restraint of sin falls under uh, general revelation. Look at Romans 1 verse 2. Or 1 and 2 there. Then there's the pedagogical use. What do I mean by pedagogical? A pedagogue is a teacher. It shows people their sin. And points them to the mercy and grace that lie outside themselves. It says this is sin. Now, if the laws aren't God's laws, then they don't point out sin anymore. So if there's a law that directly contradicts God's law, then it can't point out sin. In fact, it points them to sin as the law of the land. This is, in, this is seriously problematic. Not only is it not teaching, it is, it is teaching. It's teaching falsehood, and which leads to further problems in the civic realm. More sin. Sin which is called good conduct. So that's what the, pedag the pedagogical use is. It shows people what sin is, and since they do it, it points them to the need for mercy. 
that's very useful because there is one who is merciful, right? So the, the actual laws of the land lead people to call out for Christ. The third use is the normative use. And this is what, even for Christians, all of these are for Christians, by the way, a Christian republic, whether they call Jesus Christ their personal savior or not, they're in a Christian kingdom and, and they're the beneficiaries of the civil use of the law and the pedagogical use, they're still the beneficiaries of it. And this one drives them to it, the second one. But the third use is the normative use. This is for those who trust in Christ. By the way, when I say the law here, it's, I'm talking about the Old Testament rather than about civic law, but the civic laws would be expressions of the Old Testament. They're taken right out of it. So the law against incest, the law against adultery, the law against murder, those are taken right out of the Old Testament. They're not, they're not even all mentioned in the New Testament, by the way, but they are in our, the laws of our land, or they were up until recently. The, the use of these laws is for those who trust in Christ and have been saved through faith apart from works. So it's even for those who are Christians. Do we still need the law? That's one of Paul's great questions. Does a Christian need the law? That is the Old Testament. He talks about that repeatedly in his letters because we've been saved by grace through faith. What need then do we have of the law? Well, this is the need. It's normative. It acts as, an, and I quote here, a norm of conduct. This is how we ought to behave. This is normal. Freely accepted by those in whom the grace of God works the good. So we can actually see it because the grace of God, as you know, and because you've heard this repeatedly applied to everything, I can do whatever I want because God loves me. Yes, but there's a normative conduct that will fit somebody who is, lives in the light of the grace of God. And this is what the norm is. So this is the normative function of the law. It actually says, yes, grace, but grace doesn't mean that you can just do whatever you want with whomever you want, or even with yourself. There's a norm here, and that will help you live as free people, not as slaves. So those three functions, he simply assumes all of these are known. And I know that they're not known, which is why I'm not assuming them, I'm stating them. These are taken directly out of uh, Reformation theology, by the way. Calvin would say this, Luther would say this, Melanchthon would say this, it's, it's all over the place. And I can direct you to other uh, sources if you want more information on that. But those, th those three uses of the law, he simply assumes. And for that reason, as I say, the kingdom has gone to seed because the civil law does not do what it was supposed to do. Right? It doesn't restrain sin. That's clear. He made that clear. But it no longer points people to mercy. It makes them contemptuous. In fact, it doesn't, because of this, the pedagogical aim of the law does not direct Angelo to mercy. It directs him towards punishment. He's going he's to take care of the problem himself. He's not going to point people to Christ. He's not going to try and curb their sin. He's going to try and cut it out entirely. I'm going to take care of the problem. I'm going to tear down all the dens of prostitution and anybody who commits a sexual sin is going to be executed. Solves the problem, all right. Creates another huge problem, but it solves the problem. So law and mercy, but those three functions of the law, he assumes, and so I, I bring those to your attention. But this is the, the, the rampant spread of prostitution and venereal disease. Now this forms one of the subplots, and, and in Act 1, Scene 2, we find the figure of Lucio, whose name in Latin means light. And he's a corrupt figure. Just like Angelo sounds like an angel and he is a corrupt figure. This is part of the hypocrisy. Again, a problem of the lack of the law being applied. Nobody suffers more from a lack of good governance than the common people. They think it's good for them to be able to do whatever they want. They suffer more from their own freedom because the freedom is now indistinguishable from licentiousness. I should say this as well. So there's this, and this is a conflict in the play. What's the differ difference between liberty and license? It says in the Bible, for freedom you've been set free. 
Therefore, obey God. Because if you don't obey God, you're not free. Seems like a paradox. Except that unless you obey God, you're obeying sin. Look at Romans 7. Either you obey Christ or you obey sin. That those are your choices. You're going to obey somebody. Which one is going to be your master? Is it will be Christ or will it be sin? So if you think you're acting independently, you have free will in the sense that you are independent of all um, influence, then you're deceiving yourselves. You are under rule. You're under the rule of either the prince of the air or the prince of peace. Yes, sir. They should or ought. Now, this is, the, this is the problem of modern science that Lewis talks about in his sci-fi trilogy. It's the problem. Of, they had the ability to do it, and then the question of the ethical question, ought I to do it, that is asked after the fact. And so ethics and moral considerations lag behind those of what can we do, and modern science uh, seems to offer greater incentives for exploiting new technologies uh, that seem to set aside morality, and so we can meddle around with human nature. Genetics, change sexes, etc. I won't get too far off topic there, but, the, but the, these problems are magnified by human, the human lack of restraint and its refusal to acknowledge God's law. For the, the novel Frankenstein is an early uh, presentation of the problem there. And the problem is uh, as real now as it was then, obviously more so as technology has advanced. So he has not been strict enough in his rule and, and everyone is suffering for it. And, and Shakespeare is illustrating here the reason why in Romans 13 it says we should pray for those in rule. Because when they fail, we all suffer. It's not just a private failure. When the Duke has not done his duty and let the kingdom go to seed, everyone else is suffering. He is largely immune from it because he has the power and the privilege to use the jargon of being immune from it, more or less. But the other people are not. So, uh, Vincentio comes in and he is trying to rectify his own lack of good governance. And then brings in a, um, now back to this one verse three, because I think it's quite useful. He talks about the law and it, it's restraining an animal. He talks about um, bits and curbs, the bit in the horse's mouth, right? It sits in his teeth and you can, pull and it turns its head, and when its head turns, the body turns. It's quite a clever thing if you think about it. Because a horse is a powerful animal. You cannot, uh, a human being cannot change a horse's direction on its own. Like you t tell the horse, the horse is going to do what it, you physically could not force a horse to go where you want it. But this little bit, this little bit in its mouth, you pull that and its head turns and it goes where you want. It's extraordinary. He's, re he's referring to laws like this little bit. It's just a little thing. It's just a word. It's just a statute. And yet, when I apply it, it turns the whole of the body politic in the right direction. So the, the bit has to be there, but you also have to apply. You have to turn the bridle. Bits and curbs, they're there. And he, he, he misapplies the metaphor. He says to headstrong weeds. We don't use bits for weeds. We use them for horses. But he's, a, he's deliberately mixing his metaphors because now we don't have the idea of a horse that's gone wrong. It's just a, it's still a horse. But a weed is something different than a plant. And now we have a garden full of weeds. Terrific image for the law or the lack of law. There's lawlessness. And the law becomes an animal, a wild animal, when justice has been left. And so here's the paradox. In order for, and license now rules, licentiousness. People act in accordance with their passions, their sinful passions, rather than for the love of God and the love of their neighbor. That's what's happening in Venice. So 
how do we come back to a state of liberty in Venice? Well, we need to put the bit back in the mouth of the animal and we have to apply the law. And that is so there may be freedom. Paradox. What? We need restraint in order to be free? Paradox. It's only a paradox, though, if you think that human nature is good. Shakespeare and his audience would never think that human nature was good. They would think it was good but fallen. The but there is important. On its own, human nature never does good. There is no one righteous, not even one. All have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. So in order to re restore freedom to Venice, um, not Venice, um, um, Vienna. Vienna. Keep going back to Venice. Vienna, the, the laws need to be applied. Uh, license needs to be restrained. But how far do you go with this? Well, Angelo is going to come in and say, here's what the law means. I decree it. It is so. The axe comes down. Bang. Strong man. This is what happens, by the way, in cultures where uh, that start to become tyrannical or where chaos ensues because this is the problem um, this city is starting to become chaotic and there's no state of human government worse than that of anarchy no state if you think about it because when there's anarchy you can't go outside for fear of your life like uh, if, uh, if the police ever go on strike, don't go outside. Maybe you didn't need that suggestion from me, but don't go outside because if the people don't think they will be held to account for their actions, they will do all manner of things. And there are countless illustrations of that. One of them was uh, Hurricane Katrina decades ago or so. The, the hurricane was devastating, New Orleans, right? They put them in the Superdome and then in the Superdome, in the dark, where they had all manner of horrible things were happening. People, women being raped and all horrible things. Why did they do it? Because they thought they would no be, there'd be no accountability. That's why. When the police do go on strike, people then start going to shop fronts, break the windows, loot the things, break into houses, so forth. That's what happens when they don't, they don't fear the law. And in that state, people would rather have a tyrant and martial law than anarchy. And so... Angelo is bringing in the equivalent of martial law. That's the severity. But it, does that result in liberty? No, it's tyranny. It's, it's a tyrant just done in the name of righteousness. But it's not righteous because he's not righteous. So these are, play, this is Shakespeare's opportunity to explore very real themes in a play. Very practical ones at that. And so the question is, is liberty good in itself? And what price is worth paying for it? You will not meet a politician that doesn't want to uh, promote liberty. They all say they want freedom. Freedom to choose. Freedom for this, freedom for that. Every f they will always appeal to freedom. You, you will Do they s distinguish liberty from license? Can we have liberty without law? Can we have liberty wo without restraint? So those are questions that he asks. Now, when he begins and he substitutes Angelo for himself, what is the reason for that? Let me go to Act 1, Scene 1. Back go. So backtrack a bit. The Duke comes in, as does Aeschylus, who is an ancient lord, a wise old man, and a variety of other lords in attendance. But it's the Duke and Aeschylus that speak. So the Duke... Aeschylus, my lord, of government the properties to unfold would seem in me to affect speech and discourse, since I am put to know what your own science exceeds. In that, the lists of all advice my strength can give you. Then no more remains but that to your sufficiency, as your worth is able, and let them work. The nature of our people our city's institutions, and the terms for common justice, ye are as pregnant in as art and practice hath enriched 
any that we remember. There is our commission, from which we would not have you warp. Call hither, I say, bid come before us, Angelo. So he acknowledges this is what is going on here. The, the best, like he's about to give up his rule for a time. The obvious person to give it to would be Aeschylus. And he praises him and says, you are the as full, as pregnant with the art and practice of the city as any that we know or remember. So he praises him, but that he's not going to use him. Bid before us, Angelo. The old man is going to be probably disappointed when it comes to what's about to transpire. Exit an attendant, so he's going to go out and bring him in. And now he asks him, asks Aeschylus, what figure of us think you he will hear? For you must know we have with special soul elected him, our absence to supply, lent him our terror and dressed him with our love and given his deputation all the organs of our own power. What think you of it? Aeschylus, if any in Vienna be of worth to undergo such ample grace and honor, it is Lord Angelo. So the, ju the judgment of Aeschylus is that Angelo is a suitable ruler because of his reputation for virtue. The Duke knows better. The Duke's a little shrewder, a little wiser. Angelo enters. Look where he comes, says the Duke. Always obedient to your, to your grace as well. I come to know your pleasure. Angelo, there is a kind of character in thy life that to the observer doth thy history fully unfold. Thyself and thy belongings are not thine own, so proper as to waste thyself upon thy virtues, they on thee. Heaven doth with us as we with torches do, not light them for themselves. For if our virtues did not go forth of us, twere all alike as if we had them not. Spirits are not finely touched, but to fine issues nor nature never lends the smallest scruple of her excellence, but like a thrifty goddess, she determines herself the glory of a creditor, both thanks and use. But I do bend my speech to one that can my part in him advertise. Hold, therefore, Angelo, in our remove be thou at full our self. Mortality and mercy in Vienna live in thy tongue and heart. Old Aeschylus, though first in question, is thy secondary. Take thy commission. Angela will be shocked at this. Aeschylus probably had knowledge of it in advance. So, Angelo, now, my good my lord, let there be some more test made of my metal before so noble and so great a figure be stamped upon it. This is interesting language. The, the figure, what's the figure that's being stamped upon him? Think of a figure and a stamp. What's the, the figure being stamped upon him? That of a ruler, a monarch. He's being forced into an office. Remember I talked about the king's two bodies. The body of Angelo, the young man, is going to be filling the office of ruler. He, he's not sure he's ready to wear that hat, to look at that part. He might be reputed for virtue. He might be a virtuous man. Is he really ready to exercise the, all of the weight of the office and everything that comes with it? He himself questions it. If Angelo has doubts about it, you can be sure that the Duke does as well. And yet he gives him that, this. Now, why does he do it? It's for the reasons I suggested. He wants to teach and to test Angelo and the other. So he's finally taking upon himself the governance of his kingdom. He's got a problem. The, the kingdom is disordered. He needs to restore order, but he also needs to make, uh, make up for his neglect. And he's going to do it chiefly with this figure, Angelo, whom he obviously doesn't dislike. If he disliked him, he wouldn't put him in this position. But he also knows he's not up for it. And that's why he's going to hang around in the background and watch him the whole time. Anyway, but so that's his response. And the Duke's response is, no more evasion. We have with a leavened and prepared choice proceeded to you. Therefore, take your honors. 
Our haste from hence is of so quick condition that it prefers itself and leaves unquestioned matters of needful value. We shall write to you, as time and our concerning shall importune, how it goes with us, and do look to know what doth befall you here. So fare you well. To the hopeful execution do I leave you of your commissions. Yet give leave, my lord, that we may bring you something on the way. My haste may not admit it, nor need you, on mine honor, have to do with any scruple. Your scope, that is the extent of your rule and your power, is as mine own. So to enforce or qualify the laws as your soul seems good. Give me your hand, I'll privily away. I love the people, but do not like to stage me to their eyes. Though it do well, I do not relish well their loud applause and Aves vehement, nor do I think the man of safe discretion that does affect it. Once more, fare you well. The heavens give safety to your purposes. Okay, so then off he goes. So he leaves them with the entire rule and reign and everything over, and he can change the law in accordance with his wishes. Now, we have laws, but at the, at the top of the laws, we have a prince who is going to interpret the law and act in accordance with it. The question is, does the ruler have a lawful heart or does he have a, which will lead to liberty for himself and liberty for others, or does he have a licentious heart? Because if, if he has a licentious heart, even though the laws be good, he can misapply them. Is the ruler Christ-like in the way he thinks? Is he measured in his judgment? Is he fair-minded? Is he balanced? Anyone can say, here's the law, I apply the law. That requires no judgment whatsoever. The judgment is in taking each particular case and then applying it. The Ten Commandments are the, the sort of the, the normative law, but then they need to apply, be applied. So you shall not murder. That's one of the commandments. Okay, well, what's the punishment for murder? Well, it depends on the case. There's first degree murder, willful, intentional, that's the death penalty. What if you do it by accident? Well, there's such a thing as second degree murder. There's manslaughter, there's mitigating, right? So, but those depend on circumstances. Well, that requires judgment. And there's precedent and so forth. That's, that's in the case law that follows from that. And all of these, a ruler who is in office will need an intuitive uh, sense of how to apply and how to take the bit of the law and apply it to turn the beast. Angelo, as we're about to see, is not very good at reading the law or applying it. And it's because of his own character. But that's why he's been put there. So that's Act 1, Scene 1. It introduces the theme. And the Duke has a particular aim here, as I say, it is to restrain the, uh, or restore order to the kingdom, at, but it's also to test and to teach Angelo, and he's putting him to the test here by giving him absolute power. But the third bit, and this one is most interesting, he doesn't know what the outcome of all that is going to be. The Duke himself, okay, I'm going to give you the, I'm going to give you the keys to the car. <laughs> now what are you going to do? He doesn't know. Will he be able to drive the car? What will he do with the car? Is he going to speed? Is he going to swerve off the road? Is he going to drive into the ditch? He doesn't know. And one of the things he's going to learn when people no longer are under his rule is what they think of him. And he will behold and listen to what others have to say about him. And from that, he is going to learn what they have to say and he, he, his own character will be fixed. Because you can't be fixed when you're in the position of authority. It's too late for that. The fixing then is when you get thrown out, and that's not fixing. That's to, right, remember, he's not a democratically elected ruler. He's a prince. If he's thrown out, he's not getting back in. He's probably going to be executed or something like that. That's not, that's not a lesson. It is a sort of lesson, but it's not the sort that you can come back from. But he wants to be a better ruler, so he's going to let somebody uh, rule in his stead 
and learn to be a better ruler. Let's learn by the error of others and I will try and fix from the backstage as a dramaturge figure, prevent things from going too far astray. But he, he himself is going to learn from it. Now Shakespeare is teaching his audience in, in England, but it would apply here in Canada, of course, because wherever, the, wherever this is taught, there's a context. You see these things, you can observe them from a distance, you can see others get fixed by it. How are you going to apply that to yourself? How is the audience going to live having seen this play and everything that happens in it? Uh, let me come to scene two here. But that's the, 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 the didactic principle here uh, is that, and he's just uh, pointed to it though, is that um, um, he needs to show that Order does not result from submitting to order. It comes from voluntarily submitting, not being compelled to, but desiring to. I can tell my children to do something. It's not particularly effective, actually. I can get them to do it when I'm present by, you know, threats or whatever whatever means you can get like you can tell somebody do this and and they they maybe they may do it or they may not do it and if they don't do it then you have to threaten more I mean, you get them to do it but when you're not in the room what are they going to do what will people do when you're not around they may do whatever they want is it contrary to what you just asked them to do it may be okay but you cannot have a country that will be liberty full of liberty governed by liberty if people in public act this way but in private act this way because it creeps out so you have to get them to love the good for the sake of the good they want to do the right thing because it's the right thing so he needs to get them to love liberty and not license so their hearts need to be transformed that's the same case with parenting you you can tell your children to do things you can force them to do it but ultimately they're eventually going to come from under your governance and then they're going to do whatever they want will what they want be to do the right thing because it's the right thing that's what you're preparing them for the same goes on the broader stage in the body politic will citizens obey the law even when they're not being watched if they won't you'll have to create a police state to govern them and the police state will not be able to hold in the licentiousness it can't because the problem is in the human heart and you can't govern the human heart. It's not possible. Even though there are cameras everywhere, you can't stop it. That's not the way. You have to adhere to God's law and then and freely submit to it. So that's what he needs to bring about. People want to do the right thing for the sake of the right thing. Now, how can they do that? How will that come about? That's this, the great theme of this play, and I think it's dramatically, brilliantly done. Quite brilliantly. Um, so virtues are, and strength are no good if they're not used. Remember the Bible also says that you're not to hide your light under a bushel. That was the passage I just read in Act 1, Scene 3. It's no good, at, no, no good there. Let me go back to one scene three very briefly, and I'll, I'll come to the subplot next time, but I see we're running short on time, so let's stick with, uh, with the Duke and his thoughts here. Because he said, the problem is that liberty plucks justice by the nose. It has contempt for justice. And the baby beats the nurse, and quite a thwart goes all decorum, and then the friar says, it rested in your grace to unloose this tied-up justice when you pleased. And it in you more dreadful would have seemed than in Lord Angelo. That's the friar's response. They're used to you being mildness personified, never being angry, never being fearsome. So if you became so, the friar says, people would be even more terrified because you don't get angry, angry. You don't actually ever use the curb of the law. So if you did, it would be effective. Here's his response. I do fear too dreadful, sith, 
twas my fault to give the people scope to let them do what they wanted. Twould be my tyranny to strike and gall them for what I bid them do. For we bid this be done when evil deeds have their permissive pass and not the punishment. So he's taking full responsibility. It's I let them do this. It's, it's all my fault. This is why this has happened. I let them have scope and I didn't punish them for this. How can I now punish them? Therefore, indeed, my father, speaking to the priest, I have on Angelo imposed the office who may, in the ambush of my name, strike home. And yet my nature never in the fight to do in slander. And to behold his sway, I will, as twere a brother of your order, visit both prince and people. Therefore, I prithee supply me with the habit and instruct me how I may formally in person bear like a true friar. More, re more reasons for this action at our more leisure shall I render you. Only this one. Lord Angelo is precise. Stands at a guard with envy. Scarce confesses that his blood flows or that his appetite is more to bread than stone. Hence shall we see if power changes purpose. What are seemers be? So he seems like he's, he has no passions. He's moved by nothing. You put a stone in front of him, he would, he would respond uh, in the same way as he's given a piece of bread. Bread, he's not moved by his appetites at all. Like bread, he doesn't act like he's hungry. You put a woman in front of him, he acts like he's not moved. He's not attracted. There's nothing. Nothing moves this man. Nothing but virtue. He's, he's the picture of virtue. Let's see if he really is as he seems to be. We'll give him power. That means he'll have the opportunity to do whatever he wants. Now we'll see. But that is his response to it. Now the question here, and it's the question I raised at the outset by talking about Machiavelli, is, is the Duke being a Machiavellian ruler by using Angelo this way? Just using him. Just like Trump used Scaramucci. I think that was his name. Come in. You're in charge. He says, fire, 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 fire. And then Trump, within 10 days, and you, you're gone. Is he using him that way? It does entirely depend on the heart of the Duke, and it depends on what his purposes are, and at this point we don't know what they are. The play will reveal what the Duke's purposes are and what his heart is like, and it will, how will he deal with Lord Angelo, whom he's put in this position? How, because he is, he is fully confessing up front that all of this is his fault. The whole kingdom of Vienna gone to seed, it's, it's, it's on him. So now he has a terrible task of trying to rectify what he has let come to great distress. And how is he going to do that? So he's going to use La Angelo. He doesn't think Angelo's up to it. Okay, but now he's put a man in power who doesn't deserve to be anywhere near power. So how is he going to restrain him from doing terrible things? Well, he's going to spend the whole play trying to keep him from doing what he wishes to do in the background. Does he do it to get rid of Angelo in the end? I don't think he does. That, so we'll see what happens to Angelo. How does the Duke deal with him? What is he teaching him about mercy and justice and the right relation, the, the right relation of liberty to license? These are all for Angelo, but they're also for his audience. That he's instructing. Remember, in his audience would be kings. Elizabeth's gone, 1604. This is King James, sitting, probably, going to watch the play. He likes the theater. Sitting and watching this. How should you, King James, act as a ruler? How shall you act on, on matters where sin abounds? What should you do? You can't let it go. How do you grasp the nettle and act? Because you must act. It's your job as a prince to act. You can't just talk about it like an academic does. Any uh, comments or questions before we finish today? I did say something about the... Uh, I don't think I have it on this screen here. 
but the um, and I, I'm not going to assign the actors here, but I'm going to read the notes on acting here, and I will put them up on the website. But you're, here's what I want you to do. I'll break you into a group of three, I think, so three groups. And you are going to choose a segment of a play, and I would advise you to choose one of the plays that we are looking at, because you'll find it helpful. You don't have to really, but I think it's probably advisable. Uh, and you are going to want to choose a th something that is probably a, th a theme in the play and, and choose a segment with various parts in it. So the director, and you'll, you'll, when you're broken into groups, you'll, you'll assign somebody who's a, a director, and the director will choose, we're going to choose from, let's say, measure for measure, and the theme will be liberty versus license or uh, a Machiavellian versus a Christian political response. So you'll choose a body of text that will illustrate that theme and then you will get um, uh, players to play the various parts. And in that they will, be, they will be speaking the lines of course, rehearsed, memorized, presented, and I'll be sitting at the back like the Duke and observing. And what I'll be observing is not your ability to act because some people are better actors than others and this is not an acting class. What I'll be observing is what you're trying to do in your acting and I'll ask you even, you know, you were delivered these lines, what were you thinking when you did this? I want you to get inside the lines and think as the characters would have thought or that's what you're seeking to do. It's, it's not an acting class, it's a thinking through Shakespeare's lines class, but you best do that by having to perform them. Because now you're thinking about what gestures do I use towards whom? So if there's a male and a female figure, how would I, if I was Angelo and this was Isabella, how would Angelo look towards Isabella? Like he, he lusts after, so I don't know if you can do a lustful look or whatever. You did that really pained expression on your face. Was, oh, I was lusting after, oh, okay, that's not very good. <laughs> you know, you, you need to work on your lustful expression. I mean, okay, but, but, the, but, but that would be the answer. Okay, so at least you understood rightly that y that's how you would be. And she likewise, how is she going to respond to him? Now, there's a lot of scope in the parts for these things. And, and in the sense of, it's not clear that the characters have any nuance to them, but you can give them nuance. Is Isabella secretly attack attracted to Angelo? She's protesting, no, 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 no. Does she secretly like him? Is there, is there a little bit of that in there or is there not? You can do that. And then why did you do that? Because here, this line here, referring, and so I'm getting you to think about the parts. That's really what it's all about. Um, so you'll, I'll, I'll assign the groups. I'll, I'll send them out in an email uh, who they are and you'll want to meet together. You can meet with me as well if you, sh uh, if you choose and you find it helpful. And it'll take place uh, starting in about a month time or something over the course of a few weeks. And it's not a long thing. It's a, like 10 minutes or something. And it'll take place in a class. I won't film it. Don't worry. Um, so <laughs> it won't be, yeah, won't be filmed. And, uh, and as I say, I'll put the notes on acting up there for you if you have any further questions. But I will do that uh, forthwith. Okay? And uh, I'll see you next class.